Webster was much possessed by death and saw the skull beneath the skin. T.S. Eliot could have been describing my brother when he wrote those lines. Um, Paul was a neurosurgeon who at the age of 36 on the cusp of his career after 10 years of training was diagnosed with uh, terminal lung cancer, stage four. Um, he was a student of medicine and literature and a doctor, of course. The book, When Breath Becomes Air, is an account of his life, his life as a student, his life as a doctor and surgeon, and finally his life as a dying man, father and husband. And the book, though, isn't merely a account of those three lives in a sequence as if they're loosely tied knots in a piece of, piece of string measuring out his life. Rather, they're more like branches coming from the same tree. And what I want to do today with you is describe my experience of the, that book and my experience as his brother um, to give you a sense of the kind of person he was and what he was trying to accomplish in this book. Paul writes, I began to realize that coming in such close contact with my own mortality had changed both nothing and everything. Before my cancer was diagnosed, I knew that someday I would die, but I didn't know when. After the diagnosis, I knew that someday I would die, but I didn't know when. But now I knew it acutely. The problem wasn't really a scientific one. The fact of death is unsettling, yet there is no other way to live. Uh, Paul was about two years older than me, and it's weird to use the word was there. It's kind of a tense confusion. Recently, um, Paul, or rather uh, Paul's wife, Lucy, and I were recognizing we've got birthdays around the same time that we were now older than Paul ever would be, and yet I'm younger than him, so it's quite a strange thing that death does, it messes with our ability to conjugate. Um, Paul and I grew up in a small town um, in Kingman, Arizona. That's me and him, and then that's him running over my oldest brother, Suman, with a tricycle. I don't, <laughs> I don't really know what's going on there. But um, when Paul describes in the early part of his book our, our life, he writes, uh, this is about Kingman, the town we grew up in, near the Grand Canyon. From my desert plateau, I could see our house just beyond the city limits, at the base of the Surbat Mountains, amid red rock desert, speckled with mesquite, tumbleweeds, and paddle-shaped cacti. Out here, dust devils swirled up from nothing, blurring your vision, then disappeared. Spaces stretched on, then fell away into the distance. And that's a town we grew up in as a family. And um, while Paul and I were two years apart, in age, we were one year apart in school, so we shared a lot of the same interests, same friend group um, in high school. And then when uh, he went off to college, to Stanford, I uh, followed him. So we both went there and, in fact, lived in the same house one year and had some of the similar intellectual interests, I would say. He took his interest in the life of the mind in a biological direction, and eventually becoming a surgeon, um, whereas I took it in a little bit more technical one. But we took a lot of the same philosophy classes. We also worked at the same place in the summer, Stanford Sierra Camp, a, a mountain camp in the um, Sierra Nevadas in California near Lake Tahoe. And um, after that, uh, when Paul went to medical school, I lived in New York and then Boston for graduate school. We were never more than a couple hours apart. When he moved back to the Bay Area for his residency, uh, my wife and I, Emily, followed a few months later. I guess the point I'm trying to make here is that there are some siblings who are close and some who are not, um, and we were the close kind. And that has a lot to do with my understanding of this, this book. So when Paul writes about um, Sierra Camp, he writes, we would hit the trail at 2 a.m., summiting the nearest peak, Mount Talak, just before sunrise, the clear starry night reflected in the flat, still lake spread below us. And then we would sit and watch as the first hint of sunlight, a light tinge of day blue, would leak out of the eastern horizon, slowly erasing the stars. The day sky would spread wide and high, 
until the first ray of sun made an appearance. But craning your head back, you could see the day's blue darken halfway across the sky. And to the west, the night remained yet unconquered, pitch black, stars in full glimmer, the full moon still pinned in the sky. It was as if this were the moment God said, let there be light. I have to think that as readers of the book, perhaps you've read the book or you will, I hope you do, um, there's a difference between you and me. I think for you there's a certain kind of gap between the text and your, and your mind, a kind of air gap. When you first engage with the book, you open it up and you start reading that first page. In that gap, it's as if there's a, like a gas and it's all random motion at first, Brownian motion, particles zinging around. And as you read it and engage with it, some structure forms like a crystal that meets you and the book together. Now, for me, it's different. That gap is so much thinner. When I read that passage, for me, I just remember that hike. Um, when Paul talks about his diagnosis, a trip he took to New York, um, right as he was learning that he had cancer, he writes about it beautifully. I just remember that time. When he writes about his troubles with his marriage, I try to remember that. Did I, did I know enough about that? I, I did not, actually. Um, and when he writes about the, his sort of approach to his diagnosis, noticing his body failing, I wonder, man, should I have noticed that more than I did? I tell you this because it's my goal here not to give you a synopsis of this book, or, or rather, a critical reading of it. I simply can't do that. But what I can do, what I'm gonna to try to do, is highlight a certain idea, Paul talks about in this book, that, that I know he's important to him, and that I know that was important to him because I, he talked about it a lot, and he lived it. What is that idea? So here's some more pictures of him. Um, that's Paul and his wife Lucy, and that's Paul as a doctor. Or I think he's pretending to be a doctor, this is a totally staged photo. Um, <laughs> here's a skull, look, my finger's in it. Um, so it's this idea. Now, give me a, give me a minute here um, to explain what I mean. First, let me, let me uh, read. This is from the end of the first book of, or sorry, the first part of Paul's book, um, right before he begins to deal with his cancer. He's writing about being a doctor. Yet death always wins. Even if you are perfect, the world isn't. The secret is to know that the deck is stacked, that you will lose. Your hands or judgment will slip, and yet to still struggle to win for your patience. You can't reach perfection, but you can believe in an asymptote towards which you are ceaselessly striving. The asymptote, it's that axis there. This red line will approach it into infinity, but they will never, ever meet. These lines will never cross, even if you go on forever and ever and ever. And I think what Paul was trying to say is, it's worth it to keep on traveling that line, even though you know you will never get there. In that passage, he's talking about the profession of medicine, that at a certain point, you realize that I'm gonna lose, the patient will eventually die. And you can throw up your hands and say, what's the point? Or you can ceaselessly strive to keep on traveling along that curve. And I think that's not just an idea for medical professionals, it's an idea for, for all of us as we think about our own mortality. We're all gonna die. You're all gonna die. I'm gonna die. I am a future corpse, talking to you, a room of future corpses. And I think what Paul is trying to do in this book and with his life is to identify the asymptote being a place of absolute peace with that idea, where I can tell you that and you won't laugh or you won't be shocked or off-put or whatever emotion you felt, but you'd be like, oh yeah, that's obvious, not totally, tell me something I didn't know. Um, but there's something specific and important about this sort of asymptotic relationship. Actually, that gap is important. It's good that we never ever get to that place. Because in that space, um, that vanishingly small space, that's where grief is and mourning and love. 
that's where we inhabit those emotions when we think about the mortality of ourselves and the mortality of others. There are certain ideas Paul really hated. And I think, um, I think those ideas can be described in, this, in terms of this metaphor, rejections of this asymptotic relationship between striving to understand our own mortality and recognizing that we never truly, truly can. Um, nihilism and its twin sister, hedonism, Paul would really make fun of people that had those sorts of ideas because they're rejections of this asymptote. They're like, nihilism, well, what does it matter anyways? Who cares? Hedonism is quite similar. Hubris is a similar idea. Um, to quote Paul's favorite author again, well, this is T.S. Eliot quoting a Roman poet, so I'm double quoting here, meta quote. Um, I have seen with my own eyes the Sibyl hanging in a jar, and when the boys asked her, what do you want? She answered, I want to die. The Sibyl is a prophetess who's granted immortality by Apollo, but not eternal youth. So she never dies, she just ages and ages and ages and wastes away until the point that the one thing that she has, immortality is the one thing that she no longer wants. And I feel like that is hubris. The Greeks understood this really well. Um, and we see that today, I, I would argue. We see Sibyls and ICUs and nursing homes. And I think this is a problem that Paul identified in his writing and in his book and in his life. And I want to argue that most of us are like very close to the y-axis on this curve. <clears throat> We're not even close to approaching this problem of thinking about our death. We live in a death-avoidant culture. And I think Paul, will, in his book, is trying to move us along that curve. I want to tell you how he died, because I think it illustrates something important. Um, after about two years, Paul's body was truly, truly wasting away. Um, and there was a moment where um, we discovered Mets in his brain. He was still very 100% lucid, um, but that prefigured his lungs truly collapsing. Um, and uh, honestly, like there was a day in his home where, if it weren't for the fact that he has a wife as a doctor and a dad that's a doctor and a, my oldest brother who's a neurologist, in that room, he may have died just right then and there as he started to really struggle for breath. We were able to rescue him with a breathing apparatus and take him to the hospital. And um, it was in that moment that uh, I think he embodied a lot of the ideas he was, he was writing about. Lucy wrote the epilogue for his book, um, which, is, which is a beautiful piece of prose. And she, she writes about that day. She says, I returned to Paul's bedside. He looked at me, his dark eyes alert above the nose bridge of the breathing mask, and said clearly, his voice soft but unwavering, I'm ready. Ready, he meant, to remove the breathing support to start morphine, to die. Paul uh, was very unflinching in that, in that hospital room in his decision. And um, I think what he was, what he was doing there um, was being the subject of the sentence, I died, Paul died. It's, I, I wanna explore that for a minute with you um, because it's true of him syntactically in a way that it's probably not true of, of a lot of other people. Paul died, he was the subject of that sentence. He, he decided that it was his time to die. And um, I think that's pretty, pretty important because it, it shows that at that moment, he was very far, very far along this curve, vanishingly far, so much farther than the rest of us. Um, and I think in that moment, he was kind of showing us what it's like uh, to confront one's own mortality and to, to embrace it. It was something that he knew very well as a third person observer, as a student and as a doctor, but finally confronted in the first person and showed us something that, um, that was very powerful. And this book embodies those same I ideas. So, What I want to leave you with is, is this. Webster was much possessed by death and saw the skull beneath the skin. And T.S. Eliot's writing about the poet John Webster there. But in that poem, he also writes about John Donne, the metaphysical poet, um, whose most famous lines, of course, are death be not proud. And um, 
Let's try something. Let's try to make a little move along that curve in this room right now and just say those lines. So let's do this. Why don't I point at this room, you just say death be. I point at this room, this side of the room, you say not proud. Should we try that? All right, well, why not? Let's give it a shot. Okay. Death be. Not proud. Death be. Not proud. Death be. Not proud. Okay, thank you.